Hello and welcome back to my Amiga 500 Zero to Hero video series. We already had a lot of fun with this machine. We made sure it can boot from an external floppy drive emulator and repaired and cleaned it. In this final part we're going to build a DIY mouse adapter that allows me to use a more modern mouse on the Amiga. I also designed the kick from upgrade and switch thingy. And finally we are reassembling and adoring the whole computer. Enjoy! <laughs> The next thing I want to do is to add a newer KickROM version. The KickROM is roughly comparable to the BIOS ROM on the PC. It is the first piece of code that runs during boot and is responsible for loading the operating system or games from floppy disk. My Amiga came with KickROM 1.3, which to my knowledge is the most widely used one, and most games and demos that run on an original Amiga 500 will work with this KickROM version. But I would also like to use newer Amiga Workbench versions, which require a newer KickROM as well. And on the other hand, some older software won't work very well with the newer KickROM. So, as I did with my Atari STF, I will make a small circuit board that will allow me to switch between two versions, 1.3 and 3.1. For my Atari, I designed and etched the board myself and I was quite happy with the result, but this time I decided to design the PCBs myself and then have them manufactured professionally. This is what I hope they will look like. Just imagine all the chips being socketed and this chip here to be the pin strip that will be used to connect it to the mainboard's ROM socket. I will keep using the original version 1.3 ROM in this socket. It has a 16-bit wide data bus just like the rest of the Amiga. I only have my DIY EEPROM programmer that allows writing to 8-bit wide ROMs, so I'm going to have to use two of those instead for the second KeyCrom version. This is the schematic I came up with. It mainly consists of five parts. The connector for the socket on the mainboard, the original 1.3 ROM chip, and the two 3.1 ROM chips and an actual switch. Luckily, most ROM chips have two pins that allow enabling and disabling the chip, chip select and output enable. If both of them are connected to ground, the ROM chip will enable this data output. If one or both of them are connected to 5V, it will disable the output. The Amiga mainboard is built in a way that always connects the chip enable of the ROM to ground and by default has output enable connected to 5V, thus disabling the chip's output. Whenever the CPU tries to access the ROM, however, the Amiga will pull the output enable to ground and the chip will start driving the data lines. My ROM switch does only do very few things. It keeps the output enable line connected to the mainboard in a normal way, but the chip select pins of all the ROM chips are connected to a switch that allows me to apply 5V or ground to either the original or new ROM chip select and the other voltage to the other chip, thus always keeping one chip enabled and one disabled. All the other lines are directly connected to their original pins on the mainboard. I am going to all of the PCBs now and it will probably take weeks for me to get them, but through the magic of movie editing it will be only seconds for you. I just received the printed circuit boards for my KickROM switch. Um, this is the first time for me to get any professionally made circuit boards and I have no idea if they will work because it's my own design as you have seen before. So I'm going to open them now and take a look at what they actually look like. And there they are. Nice. And a sticker from OSH Park, which is the company I bought them from, uh, not affiliated in any way. So, nice. I hope my drillings are wide enough to hold the, um, the, the components that I want to put there. But the, the solar mask looks, looks very nice and the silk screen as well. Yeah, if, if they work, then it was very cool. Let's see how they do. To do that, of course, I first have to actually solder all the components onto it. And because I have through hole components on both sides of the board, I have to be clever about the order I do stuff in so that one part does not block the access to the pins of the other one. To make it easier, I split one of the sockets into two by removing the strut connecting the two rows of pins and also solder the two pin adapter strips that go into the original ROM sockets one after the other. Soldering 148 pins is relatively easy, but a tedious task. But nothing compared to what I had to do after that, but we'll get to that very soon. Sadly, 
I didn't pay much attention to the testability of this device, so it was impossible for me to just put a jumper on the switch connector to select one of the ROMs. Instead, I had to build the whole switch construction, which isn't really that hard, but when you're eager to test your newly built hardware, it can be very frustrating. <laughs> All I needed to do now was to pull the original version 1.3 ROM out of the socket on the mainboard, write the low and high images of Kickstart version 3.1 into my EEPROMs and install them into the switcher. Then the device went into the ROM socket on the mainboard and I connected the switch to it. With these sockets you really have to be careful to not accidentally bend the pin of the chip when inserting it, so I'm doing it very slowly. Okay, time to actually turn it on and see if it works. Nice, the new Kickstart 3.1 seems to boot just fine, let's try the original ROM. And that one works too, nice! At that point I was really proud of my design and really happy that everything worked so smoothly. And that lasted about 10 seconds until I realized I had done something really stupid. You see, I spent some time making sure the installed chips would fit between the chips on the mainboard just fine and they actually do. What I forgot to take into consideration was that there is very limited space above the mainboard. Guess what? The thing works fine, but if I install it the way I plan to, I won't be able to install the RF shielding again. So what I ended up doing was to solder two ribbon cables to the pin adapter. That was rather unpleasant work and I didn't film it because I was really upset with myself. But here you can watch me put some hot glue on the wires for extra stability and short circuit protection. This will allow me to place it somewhere else inside the case and that actually fits. It's a lot less clean than I had hoped this would go, but sometimes you have to improvise. Also, never forget to check if the stuff you designed can actually fit mechanically. Another issue with this machine was that I didn't get a mouse with it. While it is perfectly possible to control the mouse cursor on the Amiga with the keyboard, it's not exactly comfortable to do. I had two possible solutions to the problem. First I could have used my Atari ST mouse, which is electrically compatible. Only the pinout of the connector is slightly different and it would have been relatively easy to build a simple adapter that just swaps the two pins. The downside of this approach is that I would not have been able to use the Amiga and the Atari at the same time. And that's something I like to do on retro gaming parties. The second solution was to build an adapter from the more modern mouse interface to the very rudimentary one of the Amiga. This would require quite a bit of work, but I realized I had everything I needed for that at home. A bunch of old mice and a microcontroller board with enough I.O. pins and timers to make my converter. I chose an Arduino Nano as the microcontroller board, which meant I would probably not be able to use a USB mouse, but that still left me with the option to use PS2 or serial mice. I don't have that many serial mice and they are harder to find each day, so I decided to go for a PS2 to my Amiga mouse adapter instead. At that point I had no idea how the PS2 mouse protocol or the Amiga mouse interface worked, so it took me a few afternoons of research and experimentation to learn the necessary stuff. I'll explain both interfaces to you, as well as how my converter works. I'm going to begin with explaining how an old ball mouse can measure motion, as this is the basis for all the following things. As you may be aware, computer mice used to have a ball in them that rolled over the desk as you moved the mouse. But how does a mouse measure the ball's movement? To understand that, let's take a look at what's going on inside the mouse as we roll it. The ball is pushed against two barrels which are oriented at a 90 degree angle. As the ball rotates, friction causes the barrels to rotate in the opposite direction. The barrels are attached to a disc with slits. These slits are the trick behind measuring mouse motion. On one side of this there are two LEDs which shine light onto the disc. On the other side, opposing the LEDs, are two photodiodes or similar detectors measuring the incoming light. When the disc turns, the space between either LED and its detector will be either a slit or solid plastic, making the detector see more or less light based on the angle of the disc. Now, the smart part about this is the exact orientation of the detectors. They are placed in such a way that as the disc turns, only one of them will change its state from bright to dark or vice versa at any given time. Let's plot the detected brightness for both detectors as the disc turns. At the beginning, neither sensor can see its LED. Now, as we start moving the mouse, the right LED becomes visible. Turning the wheel further, the left LED becomes visible too. Another slight movement and the first LED is obscured again. And soon the second LED is dark again too. What we see here are two square waves with a 90 degree phase offset. Moving the mouse in the opposite direction reverses the order of edges on the detector signals. Thus, by detecting the number and order in which the detectors change their state, the computer can find out which direction and by what distance the mouse has been moved. And in fact, on the Amiga and the Atari ST and several other old systems, the detector signals are directly sent to the computer and evaluated there. 
Therefore, those mice barely have any electronics in them. Going from this simple quadrature encoder signal to PS2 is not a big step. Actually, all PC mouse interfaces do roughly the same, only the way they encapsulate their data differs between serial PS2, USB and Bluetooth mice. Instead of directly sending the quadrature signal to the computer and letting it handle the counting, these more modern mouse interfaces do all the counting internally and only send an accumulated count over the wire using a digital data protocol. The PS2 protocol is fairly easy. Let's first see what data is passed from the mouse to the host and then how that data is actually physically transmitted on the PS2 bus. At regular intervals, the mouse sends three things to the host. A number of status flags, including the state of the mouse buttons, and both the mouse movement in X and Y direction. These three bytes are transmitted as 11 bits each over the wire. There is a start bit that is always zero, which indicates the beginning of a transmission. A parity bit that is set so that the number of one bits in the eight data bits and the one parity bit together is odd. And finally a stop bit, which is always one and indicates the end of the transmission. On the PS2 adapter, two pins are required to transmit data. One sets the data bit and the other one is a clock signal. Whenever the clock signal goes from high to low, that means there is a bit on the data line for the computer to read. Only in this case the computer is actually the converter box I am building. Here you can see how the clock and data signals are used together to transmit the bits of the status packet. Note that the falling edge on the clock signal indicates the exact time at which a bit should be read from the data signal. The presence of a clock line makes this a synchronous serial connection by the way. There are two more pins on the PS2 connector. One provides 5 volts to power the mouse and the last one is a common ground for the power line and the two communication lines. So all we have to do now is to read the incoming data and recreate the original quadrature signal for the Amiga, right? Well, almost. One small complication is that the mouse won't actually start sending data packets until the host controller tells it to do so. And so far, our converter box is unable to send data. So let's take a quick look at how sending data to the mouse works. The basic principle is exactly the same. We still have the 11 bits, just this time we send them from the computer to the mouse. To send a byte, the computer has to pull down the clock line for a certain amount of time, then pull down the data line as well and release the clock line. Now the computer has to wait for the mouse to start generating the clock signal again, as if it was going to send data. But this time the mouse won't drive the data line of a PS2 connector, but it will instead read what value the computer set the data line to. As soon as the mouse raises and lowers the clock signal, the host knows that it has read the bit and can apply the next bit to the data line. When all 11 bits have been transferred, the mouse will generate a 12 clock pulse and pull the data line low for that time to indicate to the host that the transmission was successful. Now we know everything we need to know in order to finish the converter. When the mouse powers up it doesn't start sending its movement data packets, but instead a special status code that indicates it has finished the so-called basic assurance test. Then it sends another byte that indicates the device ID. My adapter totally ignores the ID and stops working if it doesn't receive the BAT. Then we send a single byte that represents the command enable data reporting. The mouse will acknowledge that command with another status byte and then start sending the data packets. In theory I could add more functionality like adding mouse acceleration, a higher frequency at which do we want to receive our data packets, enable the mouse wheel or buttons beyond the standard 3 and similar fun things. But at the moment my converter only supports very basic operation. Maybe I'll implement mouse acceleration someday, but I'm not sure about that yet. I'm not going into detail on how I implement the generation of the quadrature signal because I think that's very specific to my converter and not of much general interest. But if you're really interested in that you may either look up the source code or get in touch with me on Twitter or YouTube. All that was left to do for the mouse adapter was to build a final version using a fresh microcontroller board, especially one that I hadn't sold the pin headers onto because they wouldn't fit into the case. The case was a tighter fit than I had expected though, so I put the DB9 connector into the long side of it and also had to go with a cut-off PS2 to AT keyboard converter cable instead of a PS2 jack I had planned to use. But since this is just a useful tool of absolutely zero vintage value, I'll more likely than not keep it the way it is. I think I may add a switch to it and upgrade the firmware a bit so that I can use it on my Atari ST in the future, but for now I'm happy with the results. I'm almost done with restoring this beautiful machine, and in fact it's time to reassemble everything. I'm making sure the exposed pins on the side of the ROM switcher don't get into contact with any other metal parts or conductors by putting a strip of non-conductive tape over them. Don't forget the insulating sheet between the mainboard and the RF shield. Before we can install the top cover of the shielding we need to install the floppy drive, otherwise we won't be able to install its cables anymore.
so let's not forget about the shielding bracket for the sidecar expansion port either and get started with the screws and folding the nibs. Reinstalling the keyboard is really easy on this machine. Just slip it into the little plastic struts at the front and plug in the cable. Make sure to place the cable the correct way by lining up the missing pin on the mainboard with the unused slot of the plug. And finally we can close the top cover and put the six screws back in as well as the remaining three for the floppy drive. Of course I also have to put the bolts for the connector back in too. Time to put the covers on the expansion ports. Or at least on the side cup port, because I still have something to do with the trapdoor. First of all I need to place the two toggles for the floppy and ROM switchers somewhere. I decided to put them into the trapdoor, where they are somewhat easily accessible but don't interfere with daily use. I'll just hot glue them onto the back of the keyboard, that'll keep them nicely fixed but also allow me to remove them easily should I ever want to. The hot glue tends to not stick very well to the metal though, so I put a strip of tape there first. The tape sticks perfectly to the metal, as does the hot glue to the tape. This way I get a pretty good stability. Finally I put a sticker down to remind me what each toggle in each position does. Now you may or may not be wondering why I put the toggles all the way over to the side of the trapdoor. The reason is that this way I can also fit in a Commodore A501 card. That's a 512k memory expansion and a real-time clock. I got this one from eBay for almost nothing, but it comes with a catch. It doesn't work. And there's also some corrosion spreading from where the backup battery for the clock was. The seller said his Amiga wouldn't boot with the card installed, and that's true. It just causes the Amiga to show a yellow boot screen. The Amiga uses color codes to show early boot errors, and this one seems to point at the RAM chips messing up the data bus. I'll eventually look into this problem, but not for this video series. I'll need to get some better desoldering tools first, otherwise I might go crazy over this project. So you can expect a follow-up to this video series later this year. In the meantime, I'm just going to close off the trapdoor and call this Amiga Refurbishment project finished for now. And what a project it was. I started working on this machine more than two months ago. In the meantime, I had to wait for parts or I spent a lot of time designing hard and software. And all in all, it took rather long. But I'm really happy about the results of this refurbishment. When I started I was not quite sure what all the Amiga hype was really about, but even now, 31 years after the 500th release, it still shows what a crazy cool machine it is. I can only imagine what it must have felt like to people in 1987 to get such a cool machine for such a low price. And that is the end of my Amiga video series. I really hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did, consider giving it a thumbs up or subscribing to my channel. I also like to get in touch with you guys, so leave a comment or even follow me on Twitter. That's it for this time, see you soon, bye!